Okay guys, so the topic of today's video is going to be contracts, writing them up, and what you're responsible for. So I already have made two videos dedicated to jobs going to court and what the process is going to be with that and how to manage jobs as they progress. So I want to show you both sides of the coin when the contractor is wrong, the customer or whatever. And it'll be up to you to decide what you get out of those videos. So let's get to it. So the first thing that we're going to cover is the customer calls you and you get to go out to their job site. So when you go to a job site, Generally, you do not know if you're going to get the project or if the customer is really serious about even doing the project. Unfortunately, this comes with the territory of being a business owner. Some people may be wasting your time. Now, there are ways to try to get around that. We will cover that in a separate video. But for this video, you go out to the site, you start going over the job, and you start talking to the customer and you start going over details of the project and how you're going to do it. I could understand why you don't want to give away too many details because then basically that customer can go to the cheaper contractor and tell them how to do the job so they're using your knowledge and experience for free. So I know that that could be frustrating at times. It's going to happen. There's nothing you could do about it. So I laid out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. We went over a couple of different proposals of how to handle this. And we settled on the, you know, what I would say would be the easiest and the cheapest method of solving this problem. So I went back to my office and of course, you know, everything with them is very official. Even though I'm friendly with the facilities manager, you know, everything is official. You need to have your insurances in line. They want certificates of insurance, which I have. So what you may be hearing me refer back to from time to time is I was going to use an actual job that I gave an estimate on, but it just made the video so much longer, so I edited it down. However, all the information is relevant to what you're going to need, being a licensed contractor, carrying workman's comp, carrying general liability, and putting the proposal and all your certificates in order. So it was relevant to this video. I just wanted to edit it down get it down to a good time so you can get the information that you need. We'll go back to that in a future video. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled program. And they want a contract that they can sign. So the contract that they're going to sign, the first page is just basic information. When I fill out, a, when I print out the contract, I make the contracts myself. So the first page is all of my information, all of their information, and the scope of work. So the scope of work is, is very critical to the contract because let's just say, God forbid this goes to court and they're arguing over who's responsible for what, it shows in the contract that they signed. So this scope of work is going to be remove existing curb and install a new curb. So the asphalt is obviously going to be saw cut and damaged in order to do this. So it has to be replaced. So what they're doing is they're going to mesh the asphalt in with their asphalt contractor who's coming to the parking lot to do repairs on other spots in the lot. So for him, I just let him know what's going to roughly be damaged and what he has to replace and repair. So, in my contract, it states blatantly, not responsible for asphalt that is damaged due to construction of this new curb. So, right off the bat, they know I am not responsible to restore the asphalt. However, since they're not going to have a landscaper on the site, I said the grass that's behind the curb that does get damaged, we will fix. Okay, so I am responsible to restore the grass and the dirt that gets disturbed due to construction of this curb. So right there, in the first page, I already write two major points that have to be discussed. 
Uh, another thing that I include in the project is we are not responsible for any permits that you may need. So for some jobs, you may not need a permit from the city or from the county or the township. However, if you don't need a permit for the job, I would still write in the contract, we are not responsible for any permits just in case anything should happen, but you must check with your local laws and regulations. If you are going to get the permits for the project, you should you should state it in the contract and say fee to acquire necessary permits for the project and put a price tag on it. That should include the paperwork, that should include the time you spend going to get the permit if you have to go down to City Hall or wherever you may have to go to acquire it, and how much the fees are for those said permits. So you should actually be making a profit for that type of work as well, separate from the job altogether, because this is time you're putting into the job when you're not even on the site. So that should be charged for as well. I know a lot of guys who don't even bother with that, but you should because it's part of your overhead and you are working. Every minute you as the owner or your employee in the office is working on a job, you should be getting paid for that time. It should never be for free. Even though you feel that it may not be costing you anything in that interim, it really is. For you guys out there who are working for homeowners who may not know rules, who may not know any of the restrictions in their area, that's up to you to know and let them know. So after you go over the permits and what you're going to be responsible for during the project, the last point is going to be post-project warranty. Every single business is going to be different. Uh, some waterproofers may guarantee no leaks for five years. Some roofers may guarantee the work for 30 years. Whatever your warranty is, you should go over it, what you're responsible for and not responsible for. So I would never leave anything to chance. I would never leave anything left unsaid or undone and put everything on paper. No handshakes. No, I told you that. Everything on the paper. And there could be circumstances outside of your control that could affect your project. I've covered it in previous videos with concrete work where vehicles have driven over it or people have done things to the concrete, you know, especially if they throw salt on it during the winter. There can be situations beyond your control that may affect your project. So it's important to state what your warranty period is. So basically for concrete in my area, we cannot guarantee it. There is just nothing we can do. So what I like to write in my contract is we guarantee that we're going to do the project to the best of our ability. It is going to be exactly what we discuss and it's going to look the way that it should. However, after we leave, we cannot guarantee it any longer. So this project that I'm talking about with this curb how are we able to know, let's just say, for instance, a truck drives into it and it should get a crack or a chip in it. How are we supposed to guarantee that? And if you write that you guarantee the, the job, then if something should happen to that curb in that interim, you're going to have to go back and fix it. And it may not have even been your fault that it happened. So that would cost you money out of your pocket. Now, if you want to put in the contract, I know a lot of guys do do this. They give you the option of buying, let's say, a warranty or buying insurance where you can actually hedge your bet and say, we'll sell you a one-year guarantee for this job and it will cost you an additional, let's just say, $1,500. I'm just pulling a number out of the air. Where if this concrete should flake, if this should crack or this should chip, we will come back and repair it. But then you're going to have to specify the method of repair. Now, there is no way, let's just say you do a concrete driveway for $8,000 and you sell them an insurance for $1,500. Well, there's no way that you can rip out the driveway and redo it all over again for $1,500. It would be a losing proposition on your end. Uh, maybe you would state that you would patch it or you would get uh, cement over or, you know, the products that they make to go over the concrete. I think Quickcrete actually makes a pretty good product that you can skin coat over the top. So you would have to specify the methods of repairing 
said work. Concrete work, it's very difficult to guarantee. It's nearly impossible. And I would always state that we have no warranties or guarantees expressed or implied. That's what I always put. And I always like to spray the concrete with a sealer. So if you're going to do that, also specify we will come and spray with a sealer two or three weeks, whatever the manufacturer specifies. Some sealers you could spray right away. Some they recommend weeks afterwards. It just depends on uh, your weather conditions or what type of work you're pouring. Now we've come to the final part where they have to sign and you have to sign. So I like to have them sign their name, print it, and date it. And I do the same. Signature, print, my position in the company, which would be president, and the date that we sign it. So that is your fixed contract. That's what binds you to them and them to paying you. So the last part that I would like to cover is change orders. Now, I'm going to go more in depth with change orders in the next video of this series, which will cover uh, going to court. With change orders, you can either do a separate contract or you can just leave a space in the original contract to fill in later. If there are no change orders, you leave it blank. If there are change orders, you write what they're going to be. You then have the customer sign and date it, and you sign and date what you're writing. Now, I understand that there are circumstances where the people may not be able to put a signature on it, but you still can proceed with the work anyway. If you get them to text it to you that they're approving the change order, it will then be a process to go through and get all the paperwork in order if you were to go to court over a change order. However, if you have it in a text, that is just as good as getting it on paper. Sometimes, guys, ink is cheap. Texting is even cheaper. So make sure that you never leave any stone unturned and no phone conversations. If you're going to do a phone conversation, I guess you can record it. I would prefer not doing it that way. I like texting because you can pinpoint it. With a phone conversation, eh, recording it, you could have done that at any time. You could have got someone who sounded similar. You can kind of bypass that if you're a lawyer. I like texting. Signatures are even better. And like I said, ink is cheap. Texting is even cheaper. Make sure that you get that permission in some form of written form. This way, there are no questions later. Guys, I hope this video has helped you out. Thank you to every single one of you, my subscribers. It means a lot to me. I hope these videos are all helping you out, some for entertainment, some to help your business. If you have any questions, comments, you could please leave them down below. Guys, thank you for watching. I will have part two of this video. It will be coming soon. Until then, please be safe, take care, and I will talk to you guys soon.